to start that if you want to. I got a, a thing in, in, uh, on my computer from Foursquare uh, International and it's from Foursquare Missions. And just as you're thinking and praying about everything going on in your, the Ukraine and Russia thing going on, um, and I did not know this, uh, but we have uh, 32 churches, four square churches in Ukraine. Um, yeah, we have 32 churches there, plus we also have uh, four square in Russia. And so what they were, what they, what was coming out was to be in prayer for what is going on there. That the four square church, and, and if, I'm sure there are other evangelical churches involved too in ministry in both Ukraine and Russia, that all that's going on there will not, will, that the Lord would use his people and all those believers in our churches and others on both sides to minister to people, to help them in this, this time of, of horrible destruction going on that the Lord will really use and minister to them. Also in Ukraine, there is a, a uh, not necessarily a Bible college, but there is a training for people who go into ministry there, as well as they have groups that meet and help people that are alcohol or chemical dependent. Those are in Ukraine too, that are run by Foursquare. And then also they, they have orphanages that they, they take care of, that Foursquare is involved with. So when you're praying for what is going on, that God will change Putin or whatever needs to happen so that the fighting will stop uh, and the ministries there can just be keep going. But I thought it was interesting that Foursquare sent that. So since that ended up in the bulletin about blessed are the persecuted uh, when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, that the Lord will sustain and take care of them. So when you're praying about that whole situation, that the Lord will cause the goodness to come to those who are following Jesus and then also to spread that message of hope that the only thing we can have is in Jesus Christ. The title of the message is Our Father in Heaven, Thy Kingdom Come, and I want to look at uh, Jesus' teaching and what we call the, the, the Lord's Prayer is not really the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer because he, if you'll notice this, the situation that he's in there when he prays, he says, after this manner, this is kind of the model that I want you to use. And so I want to go through some of that this morning. And, and it was really neat to me that how all the songs that, that Kevin had picked out either talk about worshiping God or those types of things, or when we get to the communion about when we celebrate communion together, to how all of that tied together. So I just want to thank him for that. And, and uh, because worship, we're going to see uh, how the Lord's Prayer starts. Well, the disciples' prayer starts, it's going to be about worship. The real Lord's Prayer, if you want to read it, is in John chapter 17. If you want to read the Lord's Prayer, it's Jesus on the last night he has on earth before he's crucified and his prayer for, and you'll, he's praying for the disciples, but if you read on through it, he says, I'm not only praying for them, but for everyone who believe will believe in me through what they're going to do. And so Jesus, being the Son of God, when he's praying that prayer, is looking because even though he is in physical form and, and emptied himself of all the divine prerogatives of being divine and took on human flesh, he is still looking as the Son of God into all of eternity and realizing that you and I would come to Christ. And so when you read that prayer, realize that that prayer applies to every believer. Well, that's John chapter 17. But what we call the Lord's Prayer uh, in Matthew chapter, chapter 6, I want to look at just a little bit this morning and share some things with you. And one of the, the reason I've been wanting to do this is the Lord has just really worked on my heart through these words and through, and I'll, I'll show you the book here in a second, about the amount of teaching that is in this simple prayer and what it stands for. And so that's what we're going to look at. And then as we do that, as we come towards the end of that, realize how that affects what we're going to do when we take communion together and how, it, how we're going to learn principles that will apply to do that. So uh, first of all, let's just, let's just go. At, yeah, uh, I'll read from my Bible in this manner, therefore pray ye. And, and I'm going to read through the whole thing, and then we're going to take it verse by verse. And most of us know this by heart if you've ever heard the song 
that so many people sing, the Lord our Father, who art in heaven, yeah, but anyway. Um, in this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. So let's pray before we enter into this a verse at a time. Father, we just thank you for your presence here this morning by the Holy Spirit. Lord, those of us who have accepted Jesus as Savior have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and we gather together. There is that unique thing about just not our human bodies individually, but the body of Christ as we come together, being the temple of God. And so, Father, as we look at that this morning, may we approach it with that reverence and that awe in our hearts that because of what Jesus has done, which we'll celebrate as communion, we can now come into your presence and you are here uniquely with us. As we look at this, these words, may Jesus be glorified in our midst and may we realize that all of our needs can be met and have been met through what you have done, Jesus, through your birth, death, and resurrection and the joyous hope of our going to be with you or your coming again to receive us and take us with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. The Disciples' Prayer. Um, we're not going to read it, but just before the verses that I've read, Jesus talks about some don'ts in prayer, and I'm just going to, I mean, you can look at that on your own. Uh, but don't pray for public display or prestige or make it about if it's something about me. And you can look at the context, but it was the idea of people who would, so that people would think they were really powerful before God would make long, loud prayers in public, but their hearts were not right with God. And so he says, you know, don't be doing that for that purpose. It's okay to pray in public. It's okay to lead prayer, but not for that purpose. Um, and don't use, and he talks about vain repetition. And the concept there is about just uh, endless words or babbling or verbosity, as if the length of it is going to make a difference. Sometimes the greatest prayers is that simple, Jesus help me. And that's all it takes. But anyway, so that's what he's saying before he comes to this, because in the world that the disciples were living in and Jesus was ministering in, there had come a religion and a religiosity that somehow if we do those kind of things it will show that we're right with God and Jesus is saying that has nothing to do with it. And so that's what sets up what he's going to say about this thing. Uh, so he says this is what I want you to do in this manner therefore pray you and he starts off with our Father in heaven. And I want to just dwell a little bit about Father's we're uh, quite a few weeks away yet from Father's Day but the concept of father, and one of the things that we need to remember, that depending on what type of relationship we've had with an earthly father or an authority figure, it may not be positive. And so what Jesus is saying here, we need to understand some things about the heavenly father because we may not have learned good things from our earthly father. Now, I was very blessed to have a, a, a grow up where mom and dad were Christians, and and uh, and uh, we lived on the farm, and I won't, you know, I won't say Dad was a perfect dad by any stretch of imagination. But one thing I knew about his life, it was dedicated to Christ and his family, and so that's what mattered the most. Uh, and so, and my father-in-law, uh, Linda's dad, was also a believer, and so uh, grew up with 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 good things about that. But not everybody is that way. And so we want to look at a situation that, that Jesus talked about another father so and because and, it describes the heavenly father so we understand what kind of heavenly father we have regardless of what kind of an earthly father, good or bad, or authority figure, father or mother we may have had. And so we're not going to turn to it, but in Luke chapter 15, you'll know the story. It's about the prodigal son. And so I'm just going to go through, through some things uh, about that and, and share them with you. And this, 
i have a book and if you ever can find it or or get it i would recommend it it's by dr jack hayford pastor jack hayford it's called the power and blessing and i wished i could just read through everything he has on the lord's prayer but it would take too long but i'm gonna this is what the lord has been dealing with me about looking because he looks at it from a perspective that i had not realized before about this very simple thing of the the, the type of prayer we ought to be praying and he, talking about being effective in prayer, but to do that is to understand the model Jesus laid down. And if I have time, I'm going to read just one paragraph from it. But anyway, that's where the, so much of this has come from. So we'll go in our minds to that thing in, in Luke chapter 11. And if you know the story of the prodigal son, the guy had a couple of sons, and one was going to stay and do, and the other one said, I want my inheritance. And so the father gives it to him, and he takes it, and then he goes and takes off, to live the wild life, uh, to live what he thinks is the good life. And if you read the story, he goes and wastes all of his money on bad living of all types, and then finally ends up, because he doesn't have anything to eat or whatever, taking care of pigs. Now, I grew up on the farm, but we raised sheep. And uh, so I've not, we had a, you know, a few hogs every once in a while, but to me, there would be nothing worse than raising pigs, and that's just, the little bit I've been around and not because, and by the way, I love bacon and sausage, so it's not like I don't like the meat, okay, and ham. But uh, to raise them, no. Uh, but anyway, that's where he finds himself, and he's down to where he's so hungry, he'll even eat the pig slop. And if you know anything about pigs, as well as chickens, they'll eat just about anything that's edible. But anyway, so that's where he finds himself, and then he remembers, duh, Back home, my father's servants had plenty of food. They're taken well care of. What am I doing here? And so he decides in that thing, and, and I just, you know, like I say, raising sheep is bad enough. You don't come in from tending animals like sheep or pigs and smell good, if you understand it. So, uh, but any, at any, any rate, there he is. He says, I'm going to go home, so he goes home. And so you can imagine... He's no longer in fancy clothes, no longer driving the Corvette or whatever he thought was so nice when he left, or for me, the 56 Chevy or the Harley Davidson. No, he's going home totally broke, ugly, smelly, probably barefoot. He has absolutely nothing except himself to take back to his father. Now, here's the things about the father. The first thing, the father was looking for him. When he gets close, it says the father saw him in a distance. And the heavenly father has a desire for us to come to him. And if we have time, we'll look. But there's a scripture that says God is not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Regardless of how bad they may be, if they'll come to him, God wants them and wants to save them. So it's his quest. He's always watching for those who will come to him. The second thing is it said he had compassion on him. Now it would be easy for the for an earthly father or just in the natural father or mother to, to think, you know, he had everything, I gave him everything, and he's totally wasted it. I just assumed he'd never come back. But no, this father and our heavenly father has compassion. And that's an interesting word uh, it means the entrails. It means the guts. And I don't know if you've ever had something that struck you so hard that it almost made you sick to your stomach with empathy, but that's what this word means. He had compassion. The situation of his son almost made him sick because he wanted it so much better for them. And that's what God wants for each individual to not be living in sin, to not be bound by sin, and not be headed for hell, but to come to him and receive everything he can have because of what we're going to celebrate, what Jesus has done. He had compassion on him. He was, and then it says that he hugged and kissed him. And as Dr. Hayford points out, the, the Greek verb there, because Pastor John is so good in studying the Greek, but the Greek word there means he didn't just kiss him once. He just kissed him and kept on kissing him. Now remember what he probably looked and smelled like when he's coming home. 
And yet the father gets a hold of him and kisses him. He embraces him and holds on to him because of that. Regardless of the mess we're in, God wants us to come to him because he can take care of it if we'll trust him. Confess our sin. Repent and change. Be willing to change our way of direction. He will accept us and hug us and hold on to us. Uh, in fact, the, the concept that, that, that about him rejoicing over the sun coming, uh, that what Dr. Hayford was sharing was about holding on to him. He may have, he's talking about maybe the joy that he had when this son was first born. The joy that a mom or dad has with their child, son or daughter, when they're born, that's the type of joy he had seeing this wayward son come home. The third thing he does is he puts the finest robe on him. Now, in Louis Diglio's Passion Ministry sings Grace the One and Only. He talks about this, about everybody who comes to Christ. We get clothed in Christ's righteousness, and what Paul says, if we'll confess our sin, give our lives to Christ, righteousness gets put to our account, and it's like having Christ's righteousness put around us when we come to him. And this concept of the robe that he had was the concept of reinstating this son to everything that he had before he walked away. And in our situation, it's putting upon us something we've never had, and that's Christ's righteousness and holiness so we can be accepted and hugged by the Father. He puts the best robe on him, meaning I have totally brought you back into the position that you should have had to start with. And so that's what the concept of, of the robe is. Christ's righteousness and justification and all those big words happen to us when we come to Christ because of what Jesus has done for us. And then the fourth thing, he puts a ring on his finger. And this is an interesting thing, and I'd never heard this before. But the concept of putting the ring on his finger is the concept of giving him authority in the, in the, in the Father's realm. And you realize that when you and I come to Christ, even as infant babes in Christ, authority is given to us as children, sons and daughters of God, and that's what that ring represents. And as we grow and mature, and yes, it takes some time and some growing, and first you start on milk, and then Paul, you know, or, and then you move on to some more solid food and that type of stuff, but then we get to the point where we exercise that authority because of where we stand in Christ. Not on anything we have done, and that's the important thing to always remember. It's never about any merit on our own that we have that authority. We're going to stand on Jesus' authority, and the Father gives that to us, and that was the symbol of that ring. He had restored authority to that son, and that is given to every believer. Then the fifth thing, he put sandals on his feet. Now, more than likely, and, and what, one of the things that, that was a, a typical thing in the Eastern culture was that if you were a time of, of mourning or distress, you took your shoes off. Uh, and, and particularly mourning on the loss of a loved one, they did it in sackcloth and ashes and that type of thing, but they did it without shoes on or sandals. And so when, when the father puts sandals on his feet, what he's saying is, son, the time of sorrow is over. Let's dance and have a great time because you're back. And so that's the concept of the sandals. So all of that is about when we pray to our Heavenly Father. All of that is included in that simple phrase, our Father in Heaven. And by the way, the concept Jesus there in Heaven, this is the one who is over everything. Everything. Beyond what we can comprehend. And most of us, if you're like me, I have trouble comp comprehending the, the galaxy that we live in, the Milky Way galaxy, much less comprehending everything that's beyond that by the billions of galaxies. And above all of that is this Heavenly Father that he's talking about. And yet, that Heavenly Father is concerned about this little speck of dust we call Earth in the universe, and is concerned about every human being living on this speck of dust and for that person, every individual has, is, or will ever live, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish, 
but have everlasting life. So when we think about the immensity of this, it's also that it comes right down to caring for every individual. Because Jesus didn't die for other galaxies. He didn't die for our solar system. He didn't die for planet Earth. He died for every human being that if they'll come to him, they can be forgiven, be reinstated, and have all of that. Then he says, hallowed be your name. And the word hallowed there means holy. Yeah, how it means holy. And I'm just going to, and by the way, I, I shared it earlier, that in the psalm, Psalm chapter 23, that's where it says God inhabits the praises of his people. Hallowed means holy, and it carries the concept if you go to Romans chapter 4, where it talks about the throne. And John sees this throne, and he sees these heavenly beings around it and whatever, and they're all crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And so one of the first things that we need to do besides realizing he is our Father is to worship him, to worship him. And that's what is so important when we come together to worship. Or if you're getting into a situation that needs spiritual warfare, worship because it establishes in our hearts who this God is. And then there's also, and I've, I've heard it taught, you, there's no way to prove it, but they say holy, holy, holy. And a lot of, now I'm a trin Trinitarian, but a lot of that may be because God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the great three in one. And they're there shouting that. So it's worship. It's about worshiping God, about his praise, and, and doing that. And then that brings the ability to be transformed in our own individual circumstances, but also in the circumstances of others that may need things in their life that possible transformation comes because we're going to worship God. Thou shalt worship the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Thou shalt love the Lord your God. And that's where everything starts in our spiritual lives and should every day. Should when we come together. Should when we have urgent needs that, that need to be answered or spiritual darkness that needs to be overcome, the place to start is worship. And put God where he needs to be in our heart so that he can work through our prayers and meet needs. I'm hurrying on here. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Just briefly, what is God's kingdom? It's spiritual. It is spiritual. When he stood before Pilate, and Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my people would fight. But it's not of this realm. Now, that does not mean that it does not affect the realm we live in right now. Because the whole idea behind it is to have a spiritual kingdom inside of every individual that affects their life, but begins to reach out and affect all the other lives around them. And when that grows in a culture, then the culture changes, and it's not something you can divine and put a fence around or whatever and say, this is where it is. No, the idea is to have it inside so it can go everywhere. Everywhere. And we think of kingdoms, and we think of our nation, and we think of borders, and that's okay. We think of our state. But when it comes to the spiritual thing, God's kingdom is spiritual first, and then it will affect everything else around it as his, as his people I give to him. Then it says, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but just some, you know, you ask yourself, that's a key question in our life. Like, well, God, what is your will? Uh, and we ask a lot of times about specific things, and God is saying, well, duh, do the things that you know to be already. Are you praying? Are you in the word? Are you getting together with other believers to worship? Then some, then I'll let you know about whether you're supposed to buy this or take that job or whatever. But do the other stuff first. So what is God's will on earth? And I, I mentioned just some of it. God is desiring in, in 1 Timothy 2, 4, don't have it up here, but desires all to be saved, come to knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter, it says, God is not willing that any should, any should perish. For those who become Christians, uh, 
Romans 8, 28, it's about to be saved and being conformed to becoming and thinking more and more like Christ. Uh, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2, 13, it talks about God's will being salvation by the Spirit and believe in the truth. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it's about the will of God, our sanctification. And that simply means those who have accepted Jesus, and hopefully that's everybody here, but if not, I hope you will do that, means that we are set apart, a part of his kingdom, and then it becomes very practical in how we live, how we think, the kind of music we listen to, the kind of TV we watch, what we do with our, whoops, I'll put it over here, what we do with our cell phones and all that stuff we can connect to. But anyway, that's God's will for our life. Then it talks about the practical things. Give us this day our daily bread. And you have to understand that it wasn't just about if I'm going to get to go home and have my whole wheat with some, with some butter on it with the lunch that I had waiting on me to put in the microwave. It's so much more than that. When it talks about the daily bread, it's everything that we have need of to be able to function and live. And so it's, it talks about the daily bread, but it gets a quest, uh, an invitation to come to the Father for nourishment, renewal, refreshing for both our souls and our bodies for whatever challenges the day holds. We don't know about tomorrow, but we're here today. So whatever challenge it holds, and that doesn't mean that we don't realize, well, I've got something coming up next week if the Lord doesn't come back or I don't go to him that I've got to deal with. Well, then he can give us the peace and the strength and then the wisdom to be able to do that. And that's a part of this concept of asking for what we need to happen in our life, not just our food, but spiritually and physically and everything else. So it's a huge thing what he says there. Father, meet my needs so that I can be what you want me to be in whatever that is. Then in verse 12, forgive our debts, and some have trespasses depending on, on what you hear. Forgive our debts as we forgive our, our debtors. Um, it's interesting uh, uh, about this that Jesus in another place tells his disciples that if you, and we're going to look at scripture, he basically says the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. That if you can't forgive, you can't be forgiven. And the very simple reason is this. For us to be forgiven and to be accepted into God's family, to be his kids, it took what we're going to celebrate in communion to happen. You may not have been a murderer. I may not have been a murderer, a horrible thief, a, someone who persecuted people, but the sin that I have and had in my own life, it took that for me to be forgiven. And if God forgive, can forgive me based on that when I confess my sin, when I confess him as Lord and Savior, that puts me on a level that I cannot be saved without it, and neither can anybody else. And so I need to be as forgiving in my mind as the Spirit gives me ability as God is for me, of what people have done for me. And Jesus gives us some real stuff, tough and tough stuff in the Sermon on the Mount about love your enemies, love those who persecute you, do you wrong. Oh Jesus, you can't be serious. Because this is just exactly what he was doing when he was teaching them and where he was going to go. And he even prays for every, I think, every human being that has ever lived, but specifically for those who were there that day, the Roman soldiers and the others, driving the nails in his hands and feet. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And so we need to be have that frame of mind if we're going to follow Jesus about anybody that's wronged us. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have to sit on a jury sometime, and if the evidence is there and you know they're guilty, to say, yes, they're guilty. But it does mean that to go be far beyond that, that maybe if they end up in prison, God will use that for them to repent and give their lives to Christ, which is the ultimate, most important thing to do. Or I will forgive them and not, not take into account that whatever they did, 
as a neighbor or whatever, I'm going to forgive them with the hope and the opportunity they will come to Christ and I can lead them to Christ. Because I'm lost without Christ and so are they. So Jesus is the only answer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then do not lead us into temptation. We'll hurry through, through this. Uh, this is an interesting concept. And I, I was going to read something, but I don't want to take the time because I don't want to rush communion. What Jesus is not saying is that God would desire and lead us into desire to do something wrong. That is not what this phrase means at all. The Greek tense and the words. What it probably means is there are two things, that, two ways things can come to us that will cause us to want to do something we shouldn't do. The first one is what's wrong deep inside of us and it's what the Bible calls iniquity. And, and, and what that is, is bent. And so there's something inside of us that with every human being that is ever born, that something is bent that left to their natural tendencies, they will learn to disobey. And the interesting thing about it is you never have to teach a child to disobey. They'll do that on their own. But you have to teach them to obey. And so what that is saying here is there's that natural tendency inside of us that will start, but basically what it is is to be selfish. That's the basic root of all sin, is the ego and selfishness. I want it because I want it. I want to do it my way, that type of thing. Then the other side of that, we, we have a tempter, the devil, who wants to lead us away from God. And so what Jesus is really saying here in this disciples' prayer Pray that the Father will help us to escape our own evil tendencies and to see what Satan is trying to trick us into. That this may start out as something small, but it may lead to something that will destroy my life or somebody else's. Lead us not into temptation. And then deliver us from the evil one, and that's what the cross does. And then that's what it begins. The evil one there is, is meaning of Satan. Everything that comes from that dark side, deliver us from the evil one, Satan's lies, uh, the things that he wants us to do, his traps and enticements. Help me to see that and, and help that to, to me to be delivered from that. And then the final thing is for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, we always, we start by worshiping God. We end the prayer by acknowledging that he is the one. It's his kingdom. It is spiritual, yes, but it's his kingdom. It's his power. And that's the word, our word dynamite comes from that word. It's his dunamis, his power. And it's for his glory. Because when he is lifted up, that's when people come to him. And particularly when we're talking about Jesus being uh, God the Son, Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And he was talking about the cross. But it means that if we will make that witness about Jesus dying on the cross for every human being, that is what will draw people. When they, you know, when they realize something is wrong in their life and they need to be changed, that's where the change will come. And so as we, as we and then um, I think I had, yeah. This, was, this is back, this is just to review what Jesus said. For, this is the end of that prayer. For if you are at, after he closes, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive yours. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. And as we get ready to come to the communion table, that's one of the things that needs to happen at communion. And one of the reasons Paul wrote the, the scriptures in 1 Corinthians that we have about communion was because of the disunity and the animosity that was going on in the Corinthian church that was making taking communion not a blessing but just the opposite because they weren't living out what it was saying and so that needs that needs to happen in, in, in our lives and then we need to remember as we come to communion we are the sons and daughters of God that's Romans uh, chapter chapter 8 uh, verses 14 and and, and and uh, 15, I think, but we are the children of God. And then in Colossians 1, 12 to 24, it says we have been, been delivered from the power of darkness, conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of his love, through whom we have forgiveness 
the forgiveness of sin. We have the forgiveness of sin. So when we come and celebrate communion, that's all what the Lord's Prayer is taking us to, realizing who God is, what he's done, what he wants to do through us. And then as we, and then the concept of coming together is when we come to the communion table, we celebrate. It is to be a celebration of everything that God has done so I can be free. And yes, if there's something going on in your life or, or there's, like Paul wrote to the Corinthian people, if you need to, to get something straightened out, do it so, so that you're taking, in other words, confess your sin, get it straightened out. Yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. But if this is not what makes us forgiven, this is a celebration of the fact that we can be forgiven when we confess our sin. If 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's the celebration. It's also an examination. And that's what Paul said. You know, examine, think about it. And if you need to make something right, confess it before God, particularly as it relates to other Christians, to just let all that go and celebrate together. We're all one in the body of Christ. And then it's also a proclamation. Jesus said, or Paul said that about, about Jesus, as often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. And then Paul, Jesus said, you do it until I come. And so as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we show the Lord's death till he come, is what Paul said. So we're making a declaration today and a proclamation, Jesus is coming back. And yes, there's going to come a time when he is going to establish a kingdom that will cover the earth. But for right now, it's a kingdom that is inside of us that covers us with forgiveness. So if you haven't accepted Jesus or you need to make confession, please do that. Just pray the simple sinner's prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I can confess all my sins and wrong. I confess Jesus as my Savior and Lord, and I receive him into my heart, into my life today. And then I, I don't know about you, but I would suggest, regardless of how long you've been a Christian, every once in a while, go back and remember and pray the sinner's prayer. And at least for me, it's like getting saved all over again. My goodness, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. And accept Jesus as your Savior, and then we are going to take communion. But those who are watching, you don't have to be in a church. Just get with other believers. Take juice or cracker or whatever, because they are just symbols. Take communion together and remember that this is his body that was broken for us. This is blood that was shed for us for the remission of sin. So we'll say goodbye to that. We'll have the worship team come. We'll have the worship servers.